What is it that makes this a very happy negative charge? Why is this? Because uh, like dual resonance forms a, a negative can be on either oxygen. That's right. This now we're finally getting into the one three dicarbonyls. This is this one three dicarbonyl situation where we have the carbonyls on what we could call the one two and three carbons over here. This is an e so this is still an enolate, just like this is an enolate. Okay. But this enolate, this is an even more stable enolate because not only is there a negative charge, is there a resonance form where this negative charge could be on the left hand oxygen, there's also a resonance form where this negative charge could be on the right hand oxygen. We're done with our step one here. We're done with our step one and we've gotten the negative charge here. And now we're ready to simply go on to our step two. So what do you think might be a reasonable thing to have happen in step two? When we add these reagents to here, what's going to happen? The water's going to attack the carbonyl carbon. Now, let's see. Who's the reactive atom here? Well, like, uh, the... well it wouldn't make sense for the... It wouldn't make sense for the negative charge to pull a hydrogen back because it just got rid of one. Okay. Now, in a sense, yeah, uh, in a sense, it wouldn't make sense uh, in the sense that it doesn't help the chemist or do anything. But of course, remember, this carbon doesn't really care about whether it just repeats itself here. So, in fact, that's the logical thing to have happen okay. here. Now, one thing that should jump out of this here is not so much the water, but the acid. When we have a strong acid, we've got to protonate somebody. When we have a strong acid, we've got to protonate somebody. Now, in most situations, we might protonate the carbonyl oxygen, but this is a much better candidate to be protonated. I was just talking about how stable this is, but it's still going to get protonated by a strong acid. So let's show the mechanism for that getting protonated. And then our final product will look like this. But uh, is that not what we just had in this step, though, too? This step here? Yeah. That's true. However, this was not something that we could isolate. Okay. Because as soon as this was formed in the beaker, it would deprotonate. Okay. Of course, that's kind of, a, um, that's kind of inconvenient for the chemist that we can't isolate it at this point. But the molecules don't care about what's convenient. Mm -hmm. This molecule says, gee, uh, I'm an alpha carbon that's very, very acidic. And here's a pretty strong base that was just formed. So I am going to deprotonate. Okay, and this is our place in condensation. While this is an important reaction, let's go back to the beginning and point out all the various aspects that we have to focus on here. So again, place in condensation is when one ester attacks another ester. And we start the same way as an aldol condensation. We start with a strong base that can deprotonate an alpha carbon. And that gives us an enolate. We know that we can uh, enolate carbons. Uh, enolates are formable because they're resonance stabilized. Mm -hmm. One thing we should already be worried about is competing reactions. We should worry that instead of acting like a base, that this might act like a nucleophile and attack the carbonyl. But we don't need to worry about that here, because even if it did attack the it carbonyl, the it would just replace one leaving group with the same thing. That's something I talked about in the other video series on the Clayson condensation. In the Clayson condensation, you want to use a base that matches your L group. Mm -hmm. That way, you don't need to worry about the competing nucleophilic reaction, because it won't change mm -hmm. anything. So we want to use a base that matches our L group here. So we can just focus on this deprotonation. Sometimes this will attack nucleophilically, but it'll just give us back what we started. Okay. So we don't need to worry about that. Then the alpha carbon attacked here. And it was good that you saw that this was not like a category 1 or 3 al uh, attack on the aldehyde or a ketone. This is addition elimination attack on a carboxylic acid derivative. So our general pattern here.
So now this is the general pattern that we're going to be following, the attack on, an alba, on a carboxylic acid or acid derivative. This is much simpler, much simpler than attacking an aldehyde or a ketone. It's simply attack the carbonyl, reform the carbonyl. And you remember the key thing is to identify the L group. Attack the carbonyl and then reform the carbonyl. The only thing that's making this complicated is that we have a complicated nucleophile. Who's our nucleophile here? Uh, uh, another uh, carboxylic acid derivative, not ester. Yeah, and which atom in the ester is the nucleophile? The uh, alpha carbon. So perhaps we should keep labeling this with an alpha. The atom that actually ends up attached to the star of carbon is going to be our alpha carbon. And we can see that very clearly here. And I tried to make this picture kind of match this general pattern over here. And then you can see eventually the alpha carbon has just taken the place of this L group. It's the same exact picture as before, but the alpha carbon has taken the place of the L group. And the alpha carbon still has the carbonyl. One thing that's different here is that in the aldol condensation, we destroy the starred carbonyl. It doesn't stay a carbonyl. But in the Clayson condensation, we're able to reform this carbonyl. So we end up with two carbonyls. The carbonyl that got attacked is still going to be a carbonyl. This O uh, over here is going to leave. It can't protonate before it leaves because that would not be consistent with our basic conditions. Now, what's the driving force that lets us kick off this poor leaving group? The driving force is reforming the carbonyl. Reforming the carbonyl is favorable. But when we kick off this leaving group, we have an unhappy oxygen. It really wants to get rid of the negative charge. Well, there's somebody that it's very easy for it to deprotonate, which is this alpha carbon here. So this is a step that will always happen where this deprotonates this alpha carbon. So we end up with this. By the way, notice that I labeled that each of these steps was an equilibrium step. However, this step goes to completion. This is a favorable step because, again, this oxygen um, really, uh, that, the negative charge would much rather be resonant stabilized over here than non-resonant stabilized over here. So this step is not equilibrium, it goes to completion, and this is what drives the whole reaction mm -hmm. forward. This is important because it means the Clayson condensation wouldn't work if the alpha hydrogen had not, if the alpha carbon hadn't started with two hydrogens. Because mm -hmm. if it only had one, if it didn't have enough hydrogens, it couldn't do this last step. So we need to start with an alpha carbon with at least two hydrogens so it can do this last step, which pulls us forward. Now, what we probably want is not a negative compound. We probably want a neutral. So anytime you do the Clayson condensation, you have to follow that with aqueous acid. And the purpose of the aqueous acid is just to leave you with the, deprotonate, with the protonated form here. So this is just a technicality that we have to use to put this in. What would be a good name for this type of product that we have here? Well, we could call this a beta carbonyl ester. This is a beta carbonyl ester because the carbonyl here is on the beta carbon. So it's a beta carbonyl ester. It can also be called a 1,3 dicarbonyl, because these two carbonyls are in a 1,3 position with each other. So let's again go through the mechanism and get to the product. We'll show the mechanism this time too. 